Chapter 21 was both a lengthy chapter and a complicated chapter. Be sure to go back and familiarize yourself with all of the aspects of the innate defenses. The adaptive defenses were relatively more complicated. There were a number of important concepts here, including how B and T cells gain immunocompetency versus how they undergo activation, both in a primary immune response and a secondary immune response. Be sure to also cover the structure of antibodies, as well as the four major mechanisms by which they can stop an infection. For T cells, cover the T cell receptors, as well as CD4 versus CD8, and which type of MHC that those bind to, and why. B cells start off as stem cells found in the bone marrow. One stem cell can undergo mitosis, making exact copies of itself. Each individual copy would undergo somatic recombination. It would shuffle its DNA for the variable regions on the heavy chain and the light chain. Next, each cell would transcribe and translate this information to produce a unique antibody found on the surface of the cell. Next up, the B cells would leave the bone marrow to travel through the fetal body. The only proteins that they should come into contact with are self-antigens. Any B cell that binds to a self-antigen would become activated. Upon return to the bone marrow, activated B cells are eliminated. This is called the self-antigen challenge. The remaining cells, having passed the challenge, could next leave the bone marrow to take up residence in the lymphatic system and await activation. These B cells are immunocompetent, but naive, meaning they have never bound to their antigen. One way that they could do this is if the antigen were introduced in the form of a vaccine. Vaccines can contain just antigens injected into the human body. A B cell, when it binds to its antigen, would undergo the primary immune response. It would first duplicate itself, making many exact copies. Most of these copies would differentiate into plasma cells, while the rest would remain memory cells. The plasma cells would swap out constant regions and start secreting an antibody of the IgM class. It would bind to the same antigen, but these antibodies, now in the plasma, would be able to fight off the vaccine as if it were a real infection. Because these antigens are soluble in the blood plasma, this vaccine will mostly activate B cells. It's possible that after the antibodies are made, they could cause the antigens to opsonize and precipitate, which would make them a target for ingestion by a macrophage. This macrophage could then load up antigens onto its MHC2 and travel to the lymphatic system to display it to T helper cells. A T helper cell that recognizes the same antigen could become activated. It would start by making copies of itself, and many of these copies would begin releasing cytokines. One of these cytokines would be a pyrogen, a molecule that travels to the hypothalamus and induces fever. Others might be inflammatory molecules that could cause pain, especially at the site of injection and increased mucus production. These symptoms would be very mild compared to the actual virus or bacteria. The vaccine does not replicate, whereas a virus or bacteria does. So in an actual infection, the immune system has to chase a moving target, one that is growing larger in size. Also, a vaccine does not kill any cells in the human body the way that a virus or bacteria does when it reproduces. Lastly, the vaccine would not contain any toxins. Many viruses and bacteria can produce toxins which do damage to our tissues, making it easier for them to spread and replicate. For that reason, the symptoms of the vaccine are very mild and they're actually caused by our immune response, thinking that it's fighting an infection. 
compared to the infection that we are trying to prevent, these symptoms are exceptionally mild. Both B and T cells will undergo the primary immune response when they are exposed to their antigen for the first time. This involves clonal expansion and differentiation. Most of the cells will differentiate into effector cells. For a B cell, we call this a plasma cell. These cells only live for a few weeks and will fight off the infection. The rest of the cells become memory cells and persist in the lymphatic system. When these memory cells are exposed to the same antigen for the second time, they undergo the secondary immune response, which is much faster and 1,000 to 10,000 times stronger. It is so strong that we rarely exhibit symptoms of the infection, hence we say we are immune to that disease. The secondary immune response also plays a role in autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases may develop when a person gets an infection that contains an antigen similar to the self-antigen. Their B and T cells may not have been attacking the self-antigen to any significant amount, but after they go through the primary immune response, there will be a lot more B and T cells. After they finish fighting off the infection, they might then go after the self-antigen. Each individual B cell or T cell might not be able to attack that self-antigen very well, but of course there are now a lot more of them. And every time they do attack that self-antigen, this will amplify the immune response, going from primary to secondary immune responses, which will be even stronger. And this autoimmune disease will continue. T cells were very similar to B cells in a number of ways. They both go through the immunocompetency step similarly. A round of somatic recombination, where we design a variable region to bind a unique antigen, followed by a self-antigen challenge. The main difference is that T cells will return to the thymus instead of the bone marrow after the self-antigen challenge. Once a B or a T cell has gained immunocompetency, they then travel to the lymphatic system to await activation. And if they do bind to their antigen, they can go through the primary immune response, and the second time they will go through the secondary immune response, which is much stronger and faster. One major difference is that T cells do not express antibodies. Instead, they make a T cell receptor, which is capable of binding one unique antigen. This antigen must be loaded up onto the cell surface of a target cell onto a protein called MHC. Cytotoxic T cells express another protein called CD8, which binds to MHC1. T helper cells express CD4, which binds to MHC2. Microglia also express CD4, and for this reason, the HIV virus can infect both T helper cells and, if it gets across the blood-brain barrier, microglia. If B and T cells come into contact with their antigen without receiving co-stimulatory signals from T helper cells, rather than mount an attack on that antigen, they may instead become tolerant to that antigen. There are a number of foreign molecules, like pollen, that we do not actually want to have an immune response, even though they are antigenic. Exposing young children to as many antigens as possible seems to have benefits in that it reduces the risk of them developing allergies later in life. Similarly, many diseases are easier to overcome younger in life than when we're older, for instance, chickenpox. If we go through the primary immune response when we are younger and stronger, that is safer than waiting to go through the primary immune response when we are older. It would be safer to go through the secondary immune response at that time. We did not inherit our immune system from our parents the way that we inherited eye color and hair color. 
we did inherit the basic DNA that can make variable regions. That is kind of like inheriting an alphabet. But all of the millions of different B and T cells will shuffle this DNA differently. There's never a guarantee that one B cell will spell a specific word, like cat. However, if the DNA you inherited did not come with the letter A, then there is a guarantee that you will never spell cat. For this reason, vaccines are rarely 100% effective. There's just never a guarantee that you will have B cells and T cells that respond to the antigens in that particular vaccine. Nevertheless, herd immunity makes even a partially successful vaccine highly protective. Lastly, it's possible to get cancers of the white blood cells. Leukemia and lymphoma are two examples. Even though a leukemia patient may have elevated white blood cell counts, these white blood cells are immature and incapable of fighting infections. This patient is immune compromised and it's very important that everyone around this patient be vaccinated 